Materials supplied by Microsoft Corporation may be used for internal review, analysis, or research only. Any editing, reproduction, publication, rebroadcast, public showing, internet or public display is forbidden and may violate copyright law. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be here. Today is my first uh, visit to Microsoft Research India, but not too long ago I was uh, a postdoctoral researcher at MSR in Redmond, and that, I have very fond memories of my time there, so I'm especially thrilled to be here today. So my talk today is titled, How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Dog, and you'll see why uh, that title makes sense here. Uh, I must say, though, I I haven't really learned to stop worrying. You'll see why. Okay. Um, so this is joint work with my PhD student, Frolin Okoriza, Kartik Bajaj, and my faculty colleague, Ali Mesba at UBC. So before I launch into my talk, just a brief overview of my research. So in our group, we look at all aspects of building fault-tolerant software, uh, starting from the low-level system software, firmware, all the way up to the application. So one branch of research, which I won't talk about today, is on using compiler and runtime techniques for building error-resilient applications. So here the motivation is that uh, you want to build hardware that is low power, but can occasionally be faulty. And we expose these faults to the software, and then we engineer our applications in such a way that they can tolerate the faults. So this is mostly in the realm of using compilers and uh, doing program transformation to add resilience to applications. What I will be talking about today, though, is the other direction we've been exploring in our group on the reliability of modern web applications. And here we are interested in how to characterize as well as improve the reliability of these modern applications. So what do we mean by modern web applications? So these are applications many of us probably use on a day-to-day -day basis. Things like Facebook, YouTube, uh, Google, uh, Bing, Amazon, Tumblr, and so on. And the common feature of these applications is that they provide rich functionality to the end user. So how do they do this? Through this technology called JavaScript. So JavaScript is a language that began life as part of the Netscape 2.0 browser back in 97, but was pretty much ignored by most people until 2005 or 2006. Uh, I know that Outlook Web Access did use JavaScript way before uh, the, it became popular, but that was one exception. Uh, by and large, it started becoming uh, in vogue around 2006 or so when Google and other companies started to build JavaScript heavy applications. So the, the idea behind JavaScript was, uh, was that you execute in the client browser and it sends these asynchronous or Ajax messages to the server. And it can, you don't ever have to leave the web page, you get a lot of rich functionality from the same page. Now, contrary to what some people may think, JavaScript is as actually responsible for many web applications' core functionality. It's not just for pretty printing and fonts and things like that. I'll show you examples as we go forward in this talk. But as you may know, or at least those of you who have written JavaScript code may know, it's not the easiest language to write code in. It has a lot of very dynamic features and has even been dubbed as evil because of the uh, of certain features like eval, which allow you to create code on the fly and evaluate it. So there's this book the, uh, that Doug Crockford wrote called JavaScript, The Good Paths. He said it's actually a very good language if you only stick to these 10 or so constructs. Well, guess what? Real websites don't. And there was a study from Purdue which showed that almost no website in the wild actually only sticks to the good part. So it's, it, is, it is a challenge, especially for those of us who want to build static analysis tools. It's, it's a very hard language to analyze. Now, if I take a step back and see, what is the work that's been done in this space? So the academic research community was a little late to the game in terms of uh, studying characteristics of JavaScript. So it was only around 2008 or 2009 that the first papers began to appear. And you see there's been a lot of excellent work coming out of MSR on trying to understand the performance, the par parallelism of JavaScript applications, likewise security and privacy. But one part, or one area that's not received as much attention is looking at the reliability of JavaScript applications. So what if I'm not out to exploit the application in a malicious manner, but I just want to make my application more robust and reliable? And this is the gap that our work seeks to fill. 
So we are trying to study as well as improve the reliability of JavaScript based web applications. So one question I often get asked is, do you really care about reliability in the context of these applications? Does it matter? And this perception comes stems from the fact that some people think that JavaScript is only used for fancy special effects. Well, that's not the case. So I'll give you one example that we uncovered through a study on actually understanding the reliability of the top 50 or top 100 web applications. So this is ifeng.com. You can safely, at least I don't understand all the Mandarin there, but uh, you see there is this error message that gets displayed in the top left corner of this web page. So this is, it says, an error occurred when processing this directive. So this is a JavaScript error, and what happens is this should have been the menu bar of this website. So what, because of the exception, you get an error message like this, and pretty much the whole site becomes unnavigable. So this is one of the good cases, because at least it gives you such a descriptive message. Most of the time, these things are silently locked to the console, and you as an end user has no clue that something went wrong. And this is not the only such example. We found many of these kinds of cases where either the functionality was impaired or it led to data loss and so on. I'll, I'll give more examples later. So before, we, uh, before I launch into what, uh, what I'm going to talk about today, just a little bit of background in terms of our prior work. So we started off by studying the console messages that are printed whenever uh, you, you go to a JavaScript heavy web page. So when your JavaScript code throws an exception and the exception is not caught, the exception gets locked to the console. As a typical user, you don't see the console, but you can enable this. And if you look at it, you'll find a lot of exceptions get thrown by code which is running in the wild. We are not talking about, we are not talking about trying to break the code maliciously. This is just normal behavior. You know, you can go and look at the console and you see exceptions like undefined symbol, even uh, things like permission denied and so on. And yet the application will merrily continue to execute. Unlike a C or a C++ program where if you throw an exception, the whole application stops, only that particular event handler will stop. Other parts of the application will continue to execute thinking that this is okay, which of course is not. So when we did this study, we found that the popular web applications, the top 100, actually experience a lot of errors. And on average, we found four distinct error messages per web application. So this shows you a, a trend line here for the various websites. So one exception was Google, because we only looked at the home page of Google. There was no exception thrown there. But almost every other website in the top 50, top 100, through number of exceptions, that were logged and not handled. But while this study pointed us to the fact that there was a reliability problem here, it didn't really tell us much about the root cause as well as the impact of these, uh, of these errors. Why? Because it's very difficult, starting from an exception, to go back and piece together exactly what happened in the code. It's a lot of manual effort. Much of this code is, is um, you know, purposely obfuscated, as many of you may know, because, uh, or, or compressed, when minified. So it's, it's a very challenging problem to actually go figure out what went wrong and you know, to gain some insights into, uh, into how to fix it. Another one interesting thing that came out of the study was also many of these error messages were non-deterministic, meaning you run the same application twice the exception may not occur. Yes, Sriya. So, uh, uh, talking about obfuscation, are there tools people use to obfuscate their code? There are. I, I don't know the, the latest ones, but there, there are a couple of popular ones that have been used. Uh, there are also deobfuscators, so we didn't we didn't try to like actively break the obfuscation that was done. Okay, so. Yeah, yeah. Th those are the easy ones to break. There are more sophisticated ones that apparently are. Highly used, but I haven't seen. So, so yeah. when you say that you know you monitor exceptions and so on, but whether the code is obfuscated or not, you just counted the number of exceptions. We counted, and we also so so I'm only presenting the overall results. We actually categorized the different kinds of exceptions. So we found majority were permission denied, followed by null exceptions, then undefined symbol, and so on. So and then we also tried to discover correlations between the website's properties as a whole. So things like am I using too many evals, for example, uh, versus, and, and we didn't find correlations to find a, to cut a long story short. The one thing we found, one, the only thing we found correlations for was the number of domains from which you were including the JavaScript code. So, so this is sort of, you know, um, uh, uh, more of an experimental study to see whether it's a real problem. Right? And we, yes, we found it's a real problem, but 
we didn't realize we didn't learn much about the root costs so that's what i'm going to focus on today four distinct error messages. So the same error message may appear multiple times, right? So because you keep executing the same code again. Four distinct all these applications probably four No, no, no. There were, okay, there were five categories of, uh, and then per application, there were four distinct error messages spread out across the categories. Okay, so the, this is not the categories, the, this is actually the number of distinct error messages. So yeah, I mean, okay, depending on your point of view, you may say four is not a bad number, right? But it, this is, production code and it's throwing exceptions. So to me, that is what he said. So uh, one, they, they come up if you just run the web application with our test suite. I mean, this is, we, didn't, we didn't try to break them in any way. The only thing we did was to modify the speed of testing. So we tried to do fast, medium, slow, but the website is supposed to be resilient to this. It's not supposed to depend on this. So, so one surprising thing that, yes. How much of this is browser specific? Uh, that's a good question. So when we did the study, this was done on Firefox, uh, but later we actually went and tried to, so, so, so the number of error messages may be browser specific, but the overall trends still hold. So um, in, the, in the later part of the talk, I'll talk about we, how we use bug reports, and there it turns out about only 20, 25% of, of the bugs are browser specific. So 75% are not, so which is interesting. So one thing I just want to mention, it's an interesting finding, was that many errors were non-deterministic, which is counter to at least my intuition, because I think of you know, JavaScript as single threaded, right? So where is the non-determinism coming from? Well, it turns out the asynchronous, asynchronous calls, timeouts, as well as advertisements, introduce quite a bit of non-determinism. So it's not straightforward to reason about these things by using, say, you know, simple syntax check, not syntax checking, but you know, code checking kind of tools, you really need semantic awareness there. Yes? So is this the JavaScript just for the website? Like if, if CNN, for instance, is this JavaScript just produced by CNN? Or like are they hooking in with third-party plugins? And so this includes everything. So this includes everything. This includes the to sum of all JavaScript that gets loaded when you go to, say, CNN.com. Right? Uh, we also tried to isolate it, but it's, it's not always possible because some of these they distribute their own code with many third-party providers. Um, CNN, I'm sure, is linking to Tumblr, Facebook, Twitter, things like that. Right. They could have error messages coming. In. That's true. So we didn't. Yeah, we, we don't classify it based upon the domain. So I, I can say more about this study if you're interested. I, I I just want to this point say that okay, error messages are you know errors are a problem in JavaScript in production web applications. So what I what we are trying to do now is to yeah, actually just one more sure. Thing. So this, by the way, is not may not necessarily be unique to just JavaScript. I mean, a lot okay. of production code, uh, even on on that runs in, in the cloud or wherever, can throw a lot of exceptions, and the application will continue running. Right? Well, I'm just trying to understand why. How 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 because if we have a Java uh, piece of Java code, right? It throws an exception, and the exception is not caught. Typically, at least that thread will get terminated. Yeah, just that thread might get terminated. Like, I mean, if you have okay. a request processing app, that, that mm -hmm. request may get through an exception, but the rest of the app will keep running. Uh, okay, I, I can see that. So, 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 so at least the, the saving grace there is that thread is somewhat an independent piece of computation mm -hmm. in that application, so it probably doesn't propagate to other parts of the code. Right? In JavaScript, we're talking about event handlers. So one an event handler throws an exception, only that handler gets terminated. Other event handlers, downstream handlers, may depend on the computation, may depend on the value produced, and they would execute, assuming this guy has finished so correctly. That how the app is yeah. Yeah. Also isn't right. I mean, if I, I might write a UI, mm -hmm. which yeah. actually just, you know, which is independent. Loop, right. But pass exceptions and pass them and just handle the next one. So that that app will function the same way. That's true. That yeah, great. yeah. So, so yeah. So we didn't go in and actually analyze what are the sort of the application impact. But in this study, but what I'm going to be talking about next, we did do that analysis. So you'll see that, in fact, many of these were not handled by the application or, or, or resulted in severe impact. Did you have a question? Or, okay. so, so what I want to say is you know, that was sort of the motivation to say why we, why we started doing the bug report study. Right? Because we want to understand the root cause as well as the, uh, the, the, the impact of these uh, JavaScript bugs. So for the bug report study, as I said, one is we want to ask for why, why do these errors occur? 
then we want to ask what impact do those faults have. Unfortunately, I can't go to CNN.com and say, share with me your bug database. You know, they, 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 they'll laugh us out of the rope probably. So what we tried to do instead is look at the open source JavaScript applications. And we looked at 12 popular ones. And we gathered the bug reports through these uh, fora, which are not very structured. I'll talk about how we did that. And then we tried to systematically understand the root causes here. So these are some of the applications we considered. Um, so we looked at eight JavaScript web applications and four JavaScript libraries. So you might recognize some of these names, like WordPress, jQuery, Wikimedia, and so on. So these are, yeah, they're not you know, in the top 50, but we think they're still popular web applications. And it's worthwhile understanding what are the kinds of errors or, or bugs that, that were there in these applications. So uh, I should mention uh, ahead of time, we, we initially, when we did this, we thought there would be differences between applications and libraries. We didn't find those differences. So even though we have eight applications and four libraries, I'm just going to present these results as one pool. So here's a little bit about the methodology. So we remember we are looking for JavaScript bugs, right? So we first thing we did is we searched for all bug reports that are the word JavaScript. So very, you know, go to the uh, bug repository, search for it. Then what we do is we filter out any report that has not been marked fixed. So why do we do this? Because you'll find many of these bug reports are not really bug reports. There are some user complaining that some feature is missing or just misunderstanding the feature. So we wanted to make sure we were studying real bugs. So when something has been marked fixed, it means a programmer went in, programmer of the open source application went in, invested time and effort in fixing it, and then marked it as fixed. So to us, that means it's a real bug. And uh, my student also actually read through the whole change logs for each of these to make sure that the bug really involved JavaScript. Okay, that, that was one of our, uh, you know, this was a painstaking process because there were 300 plus of these reports. And then what we did is we picked the first 30 reports for each application, and then we manually analyzed them after putting them in a standard format. So this is how we went about gathering the bug reports for the, for the results I'm going to present next. So here are the, the research questions we asked. So the first question is, what type of JavaScript faults occur in web applications? So to cut a long story short, we found a variety of different types of faults. But one kind of fault that really stood out was what we call incorrect method parameter. Okay. Here, you're passing a wrong argument to a method in the JavaScript code. So let's say, what's the big deal? Well, it turns out that most of these methods were calls to the DOM API. So for those of you who may not know what a DOM is, it's just a hierarchical representation of the web page. The JavaScript code interacts with the DOM through well-defined API. Things like get element by ID and so on. And what we are finding is that you know, around 66% of the overall pie of bugs was because one of these API parameters was specified incorrectly. Now, if you think about that for a minute, what it means is that as a programmer, you seem, uh, so, so programmers seem to have an incorrect understanding of the current state of the DOM at any time. So they're either trying to retrieve an element that is not present in the DOM, or they're trying to retrieve some property or assign some property of an element which does not have the property. So, okay, JavaScript is dynamically typed, so you can do things like this, right? But you're going to get a runtime exception when you try to do this. So let's look at an example of what might be a DOM-related fault. So let's say, here's, here's a sample DOM of a Hello World web page. So I want to retrieve this div element here. So what I would do is I would write something like document.getElementById of lm. Now, um, I've given an example here of using the native DOM API. You could just as well be using jQuery or any of the fancy libraries. The core problem does not change, because you still need to specify an element to retrieve. Now, when you try to return, instead of, let's say instead of lm as id, you have a typo and say alme. Now, this API call will return a null, and the null value will propagate in the code, for example, and then finally, when it's used in some computation, that's when you get the exception. So this is an example of a DOM-related fault, which, if you remember from the pie chart, was responsible for two-thirds of all the bugs that we studied. Now, just to make it clear though, I've given a very simple example where there's a string constant and it's a typo. This string could come from computations, in fact, as it often does. 
this is often produced with, by loops and so on because you know you don't you don't want to access each element by its name you you try to come up with a general algorithm so trying to find what went wrong is non trivial in this case as i will show you examples of of why this so, is the case uh, when you are counting this uh, are you saying you said this could cause a null day preference yes so uh, when you went through the bug reports you traced back and found the root cause and then you decided it was a down. So, so, so when we went through the bug, so the bug report actually tells you uh, what was the what, what is the fix applied to it, right? So, so if the fix involved the changing of a DOM related API, we also looked at the, the text message to make sure that we are not. So, I, I I will talk a little bit more about the impact where you'll see what how we classify the impact. So, just some terminology here. So, okay, you don't have to read this code. This is just JavaScript code to print hello world. So basically, you're going to uh, have an error in, say, line two, where you misspell hello to H-L-E-L-O. Then in line four, you're going to try to retrieve an element with the get element by ID. So we call this the error, this is the fault, and finally the failure is a null exception. Okay, so this is just the terminology we adopted. It's a little different from some of the uh, terminologies in some other communities, but for us, the error is the, the place where the fault originated, the fault is when you try to do the DOM and then failure is the exception. So, okay, so the, the high level takeaway of the first question is lot of these errors are DOM related. Lot of these faults. Uh, yes, Srino. I mean, this guy has nice all the files. Compilers can check them. Why do you use? Ah, okay. <laughs> That's a good question. So, so I think there are two two things going on here, right? Pass, all those you out. No, no, XPath is fine. This is orthogonal to all that, right? What I'm saying is actually now we can do tokenization, we can do parsing, and we can actually do type checking and make sure that. So, so this is orthogonal to type checking, right? Because you need types on the DOM. I mean, types on the code won't give you this, because the problem seems to be that programmers don't have a good mental model of the DOM. So I think that the DOM, yes. Uh, okay. That this was a type of type. This is, so, as I said, that's a toy example, right? right. Uh, so, so in real world, in the, in the bug report, for example, we'll find you try to concatenate a string multiple times with various okay. inputs and then try to access it. So in a sense, the DOM errors themselves can probably be categorized into multiple categories. Like typo is one category. But typo is a very small category. I just okay. gave that as an example because it's easy to see in one slide, right? So there are. Uh, I look at. I, I'll show you more examples. For example. Uh, in one website, uh, the 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 pro programmer forgot to pass a parameter to a function, and in JavaScript this is allowed. Okay, it was an asynchronous call to a function, and depending on your web browser, it would either set it to a random value or set it to an undefined value, and that would propagate to the get element by ID. You try to retrieve an element that is not there, you get an exception. Right? Yes. So how does TypeScript? Uh, okay, <laughs> so okay. Honestly, I've only played with the website version of TypeScript on the website. Now, I think this is orthogonal to TypeScript because you still need a way to access a DOM element, right? As far as I understand, TypeScript gives you a way to do inheritance and stuff on the JavaScript code, but not so much on the DOM. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong here. I, is, I mean, I have limited understanding, but I think it can do that as well. Okay, we should. It checks parameters. It checks. It does, it but but, 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 but parameter. So it's not a type error in the parameter, right? I'm giving I'm giving the correct type but wrong value parameter, and the wrong value is because I have a wrong understanding of the DOM state. Yeah, but so, uh, coming back to the other example where you're missing uh, parameter. Okay, that that, that I, I agree with you. I can see that can be done by so, type. So type right. part I understand, and there are a lot yeah. of other techniques like. Uh, if you look at some of the auto-generated code for mm -hmm. uh, Windows Phone applications which use XAML, mm -hmm. so everything is done with strings there so, as well, and then there is type checking introduced right. on the string. So, 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 I, so I haven't looked at Windows 8 Phone, yeah. but I will say this, we looked at whether libraries, using a library makes a difference, and it does not, at least from our results. So whether you use jQuery or, or Moodle or whatnot to, to, to come up with a way to access the DOM element, you still make... A pile of yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> it's awesome, but it has right. Okay. But at least that was the de facto. In fact, yeah. um, the other study I mentioned, we found there's a reverse correlation. The more libraries you use, the more bugs you seem to have. Okay. Because maybe the code is more complex, right? So, so we didn't actually. You're right. I mean, maybe all these problems go away if you have an auto-generated, 
you know, way to, to generate. But, but you know, that remains to be tested. And I have a question. I don't know. So right. Yeah, we, we didn't look at that. Thank you. So how much of it is related to wrong type versus wrong values of that So the wrong, so what do you mean by wrong type? Like, in stuff string, right, it's like a number of Oh, that was not, no, it was mostly wrong value. Wrong yeah, wrong. Yeah, these won't get caught. I mean, the example I gave where you miss a parameter, that might quite get caught. Too. But that's a small portion. That's a, that's a very small portion. So I'm going to keep uh, moving on here in terms of the research questions, but feel free to, you know, we can revisit this question at the end, if you like. So the next question we asked is, what is the nature of failures that stem from JavaScript faults? Okay, and again, I'm going to classify this as non-DOM versus DOM related in exactly the same way as I did before. So you find that for a non-DOM related fault, about 90% of those faults resulted in an exception, meaning that you could actually see that when you ran the test case. With the DOM related fault, only about 40% resulted in an exception. So this might also explain why it is harder for a programmer to track these DOM related faults. Because you don't see it as an exception, right? It, it shows up in some subtle output chain somewhere. And then it requires a user to go open a bug report. Even more interestingly, we asked, what is the impact of the JavaScript fault? Like, here, you know, so far all I've said is, okay, they lead to an exception or output chain, but so what? So, the exception here, wait, transitively causing an exception is also included. It eventually leads to an exception. That's right. So, so because all we see is, okay, is there an exception when you have this fault? So the, even, even the fact that it does not lead to an exception doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad outcome, right? Because it may be something that's just a cosmetic effect. So then we asked, what is the impact of these DOM-related faults? Here we are using the Bugzilla classification of impact, uh, but we actually went through the reports and made sure they were consistent. So type 1 means lowest impact, type 5 is highest impact. Okay, this has been used in other studies as well. And the number, y-axis shows the number of bug reports, x-axis shows the types. And the dark gray bar is all faults, light gray is all DOM related faults. And I hope you can see it, that for type 5 faults, 80% of the highest impact faults were DOM related. Meaning that when you have a, a highest impact fault, you, you are more likely than not that it's, that it's a DOM related fault. So a DOM related fault is not something that is just cosmetic. I mean, sure, there are those as well, which you'll see in type 1. But many times, many of these faults have high impact. And we're talking, when it, just to give you some intuition of what I mean by high impact, we're talking about things like data loss. So in an email client, for example, there was a DOM-related fault, it led to an empty email being sent. The email was dropped. We're talking about security violations. In typo 3, some security-sensitive data was displayed on the client side. Uh, we're talking about browser hangs. We actually found a couple of those where your code goes into an infinite loop and your browser says, kill it. And you know, yes, we kill it, but then for some reason, the browser hangs after that. Okay, this was Firefox. So I don't know why, but they, these are, and, and this categorization of types was done by the programmers who were fixing it. So in terms of the priority and the severity level. So this, so far what we have seen is that you have DOM-related faults being the majority. They don't result in exceptions and many of them have high impact. We then wanted to ask ourselves a question, what causes these DOM-related faults? Now, um, you remember we don't have very sophisticated tools at this point to go in and actually trace back and so on. So we did a very simple analysis, and then we tried to augment it based upon our understanding of the code patterns. So our analysis is as follows. So we've looked at the fix that the programmer made to fix the, the, the JavaScript fault. And we asked ourselves, where was the fix? Uh, which parts of the code base did the fix touch? Did it touch the HTML? Did it touch the server side? Did it touch the JavaScript? Okay, and the reason we asked ourselves this is, let's say all the fixes touch the server side. Then it's not JavaScript's fault. It's not the JavaScript programmer's fault, right? It's the server side code that's having a problem. Let's say it touched the HTML, then it's something else. It's uh, the web designer's fault. And the results, sure enough, showed that 86% of those faults were actually in the JavaScript code. So this was, when you think, think about it from a DOM perspective, some j other JavaScript code in the application made an incorrect change to the DOM or left the DOM in an inconsistent state. Now you have further downstream code go in and try to interact with the DOM and, and get experience a DOM-related fault and take an exception. So 
the causal chain is not by external entities like HTML server side. It, you, can, you can sort of trace it within the JavaScript code and perhaps even fix within the JavaScript code. Yes? Could this have something to do with the fact that you search for JavaScript in the... Okay, that's a great question. So we are, our whole study is focused on client-side JavaScript bugs, yeah. right? So yes, so maybe at some level it's not surprising. Client-side JavaScript bugs occur due to JavaScript code. But at another level, if, if the result had turned out the other way, let's say it was all server-side code's fault, then there's limited stuff you can do at the client side to actually understand and fix the fault. Right? So this was more to motivate the, the second part of this talk. I'll talk about some tools we built to, anal to do backward slice, analyze the root cause, and even to suggest some fixes through program repair techniques for these faults. So the final, uh, we also, I don't present the data here, so we also found that most of these were not browser specific. So as I said, only 25% were browser specific. So uh, it's not like they occur in IE but not Firefox or anything like that. Okay, finally, the last question we asked is, how long does it take to fix a JavaScript fault? So uh, is it the case that uh, JavaScript faults get you know, fixed really quickly or what is the time duration? But I should mention before I show the result that the times, the absolute times don't make much sense. It's only relative times that matter. Because remember, these are open source applications, so they're not necessarily dedicated programmers sitting and fixing these faults as they come by, right? So it could just be that it's a hobby or something, and it takes a long time to fix some of these faults, which is probably not realistic. So this is the, the graph. So y-axis is the average number of days, and x-axis is uh, the triage time and the fixed time. Triage time is time from when the bug report was opened to when it was assigned or commented on by a developer. Fixed time is time from when it was assigned or commented on to when it was actually fixed. And uh, the number of days, of course, you see is 90 days. You know, probably, I'm 100% I'm sure the programmer was not sitting and breaking their head for 90 days trying to fix the fault. But it gives you a relative sense of the priorities. So for the DOM-related fault, it turns out that they get triaged much more often than non-DOM related fault. So either because they are considered important or uh, it's easy to pin blame. Uh, interestingly though, when you look at the fixed time, the DOM related fault takes about 90 days to fix compared to 60, uh, 65 days for the non-DOM related fault. So again, this shows that the DOM related faults probably require more effort to fix. And one intuition, one, you know, we looked at the fixes, it seems like the fixes are scattered much, much more over the code for a DOM-related fault than a non-DOM-related fault. So you might end up, so you need to have a good global view of the whole code before you go and fix one of these faults. Whereas for the non-DOM-related faults, it's mostly confined to a single procedure or at most a single you know, group of functions. So, to, so let's now take a step back and say, okay, what are the things we learned from this bug report study because that is going to motivate the kinds of tools we built to address these, these faults. So the first finding was that the DOM-related faults dominate JavaScript faults. They're responsible for nearly two-thirds of all the faults. So if there is one thing we need to focus on, it is DOM-related faults. They mostly lead to output errors, which makes them much harder to find. They're responsible for 80% of the highest impact fault, uh, and also some low impact faults. They arise in the JavaScript code, and they take about 50% longer time to fix for many developers. So all this points to one thing. We need good tools that can help programmers reason about the DOM so that A, they don't make those faults in the first place, and B, given that a fault has occurred, to isolate the root cause and suggest fixes so that programmers can adopt it. So we went in the latter direction. So our, the rest of this talk is going to be about some of the tools we built. One is to actually do a backward slice, dynamic backward slice, from the point of when an exception or uh, exception occurs to finding the incorrect DOM API method, and then another tool to suggest a fix for the fault based upon common patterns of, of the DOM, or common patterns of DOM manipulation. And the high level intuition here as to why these tools work is that because it's a DOM related fault, it makes our search space much smaller than searching over all the code paths that might lead to a fix. Meaning that if I have to suggest fixes for code, the space is much larger than if I have to suggest fixes based on a 
smaller section, set of the DOM. So you'll, you'll see, okay, I mean, uh, I'm, this is sort of more high level intuition. I, I don't have numbers to necessarily say that one space is bigger than the other, but this is why we think these techniques work in practice. So I'll give you a minute if you have any questions now about the bug report study, as I'll go into the, uh, the, the dynamic slicing techniques and, yes. That's a good question. So um, they're not very large. Okay. So uh, if you look at we're talking. So if you get number of lines of code, probably about less than ten lines of code. But if you look at the scattering, that that varies widely, as I said. So yeah, the, the fixes themselves. I, I I don't have the data on in the in this talk, but we also looked at the different types of fixes. So one interesting thing we found is many times programmers don't fix the root cause of the problem. They introduce a workaround. It is actually a good thing for us because that means our automatic fixing tool also has a lower bar, right? So, okay. So moving on to autoflocks. So autoflocks is a tool to actually go and identify the DOM-related API access when you have a DOM-related JavaScript fault. The high-level idea is very simple. Um, what it's going to do is so it's going to assume that your DOM your, your fault has resulted in exceptions. So I know that I said that DOM-related faults don't often result in exceptions, but we just made this assumption because we don't currently have a technique to find these faults. So I assume somebody else has found the fault and I want to root cause it and fix it. Right? So, uh, so you could conceivably use this if you had a way to find the fault too. So here's the example I alluded to earlier. And this is the, case, this is the example where I forgot to pass a parameter to a function which maybe TypeScript will catch, I don't know. So this is from the Tumblr website. So what Tumblr does is it shows you advertisements by cycling through four banners every five seconds. Okay, you don't have to read all the code here. If you look at the last line, uh, you see the problem. So this, it's calling set timeout with change banner and 5000 is the argument for the timeout period. Except the change banner expects a banner ID as an argument. So the user, has for, the programmer has forgotten to pass this. So most JavaScript implementations will accept this. They won't complain. Uh, the latest version of Firefox will set banner ID to undefined. Earlier versions will set it to a random value. Now you use the banner ID here in the get element by ID. Um, and because of course it's undefined, it would say there is no such element. So this will return null. And then it's going to result in a null exception here on line so, 9. Sorry, so that, is that a function call or just... Oh, this one here? Change banner. I mean, yeah, yeah, that's, a, that's an asynchronous call. So it's saying call the one from set timeout. So it's, it's saying five seconds from now, call, call change banner. Okay. Right, so, so that's so a... If you really want to pass parameter, then you have to create another, another function here. You could do that or you can pass it as part of... So you can just say set timeout, change banner, comma, 5000, comma, parameter. Right, yeah. I mean, that's just the, you know, the, the JavaScript DOM API syntax. So, right. so, so this is a, a function call, but the JavaScript you know, runtime doesn't say this an error because it allows this to happen, for example, that you don't specify an argument. So anyway, so the, the, the idea here would be starting from the exception, can I identify which DOM API call return null? And then going further back, can I say that actually the fix was to pass an extra parameter over there? Okay, so that's the that's the goal. Um, just some um, high-level idea of the implementation. So we first run our web application. We use a crawler uh, called uh, Ajax. Uh, sorry, um, called, well, okay, forget it. <laughs> Crawl Ajax, and then you run the web application, generate traces, and then we partition the traces into different sequences, and then we extract which sequence is the important one, and we analyze the backward slice. So at a high level, there are two challenges here. One is you might have asynchronous calls, so I need to figure out the causal sequence of events that led me down the chain. Right? So if I have a sequential program, finding a backward slice is not difficult because I know the execution flow. In an in a asynchronous program, I've got to piece together the different sequences so that I can work my way through the backward slice. But this is all dynamic, so we can instrument the code and do it. Um, the second portion, the second challenging part is we need to be able to, uh, to, to isolate 
the DOM API call through the data dependency. So we need to log at every, because JavaScript is highly dynamic, it's, it's often difficult to just statically look at the data dependencies. So for every line of code, you need to log the data dependencies and what are the values so that you can then piece these together. So um, due to lack of time, I'm going to skip the exact way we do this, okay, because this is, it's, it's straightforward to figure it out once you understand how to, how to do the instrumentation and that's, uh, that, that just has to do with adding the trace functions at the right places. I can talk to you offline about it. But to, to cut a long story short, in this example when you run order flaws, what it would do is it would say uh, this line, the document.getElementById is the one, is the, is the bad DOM access function. So that's starting from the exception, it's identified which DOM access function returns the null value. And then further, you can, the next tool I'm going to talk about with Jarvis, it would further go back and say banner ID is the wrong value. So you should have passed the correct banner ID and even tell you what that value should have been for this code to not throw the exception. Did you have a question? So, okay, we used some existing tools and we evaluated autoflux on three applications. So these are uh, not very big applications, but they still have substantial amounts of JavaScript. So talking about tens of thousands of lines. So there's task free to do and WordPress. We introduced mutations. So we, we actually uh, had a tool that would inject faults by mutating the code in a way similar to how we found the bug. And then we checked how often we were able to correctly identify the DOM access method. And for to-do and task freak, our success rate was 100%. For WordPress, it's only a little over 50%. The reason is because our tool doesn't support anonymous functions, or did not support anonymous functions at this point. So WordPress actually has a lot of anonymous functions. So if the slice crosses an anonymous function, we'll give up on it. Since we published the paper, we actually support it. So now our success rate for WordPress is about 95%. Okay, there are still some really complex uh, recursive calls of anonymous functions we don't support. So that's the other 5%. But overall, this is, we think, pretty good accuracy. So we're able to isolate the, the root cause of the JavaScript bug uh, with about 90% or more accuracy. Now, we also measure the overhead. So we were able to do this on the Tumblr website as well. And this was the most complex one, so it has about 35% overhead. It's a dynamic technique, so you know you do have to pay runtime overhead for the tracing. So the next, so this is auto flocks where we are trying to isolate the root cause. The next tool we are working on right now is Vijavis, which is to automatically fix the JavaScript fault. So I just give the intuition behind Vijavis. So Vijavis starts from the DOM interaction point. That is the the output of auto flocks is the input of Vijavis. So it says here's the DOM related API method. Now what we are going to do is we are going to find a workaround such that, so, 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 so the DOM related API method is the one that couldn't find the, the DOM value. So it's going to look at the set of all candidate DOM values and find the one that is the closest match to allow this code to continue without an exception. Once it finds such a match, it's going to go backward in the code and use a constraint solver and ask how should I have modified the code so that this is the value that gets passed to the DOM API method. And the reason this works well in this case is because our search space is restricted to the DOM, which is much smaller compared to searching over all possible code patterns. Because, okay, programmers seem to use very definitive ways of naming the DOM elements that we can leverage on. So I'm just going to explain this with a short example here. So let's say you have a DOM tree that looks like this. You have a piece of code uh, that looks like this. And you're trying to, so basically what you're doing is you're setting up the string called pre, uh, pre, and then you're doing running a loop, i equals 0, i less than equal to 3, and then you're going to go x, find a p element, so this is a CSS selector with the value given here. Okay, and so you, this will evaluate to pre 0, 1, uh, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 2. When it comes to pre 0, 1, 2, 3, there's no such element. So this is a classic off by one error. It should have been i less than 3, but it's i less than equal to 3. So what our tool would do, what Vijavas would do is, it would first of all assume that this CSS selector is wrong, because that's the one that, you know, Autoflux tells you this is the CSS selector is wrong, so it starts from that place. Then it's going to find all the components, all the P components in the DOM that has 
that, that has close closed uh, string matches. So, so ID name is PRE0123, but what it's going to do is, so it's going to say PRE0123 are the elements of this ID, and it's going to identify PRE0, PRE01, or PRE012 as possible candidates for that last thing which didn't match. Now, at this point, you might ask why it didn't identify the span, which is also called PRE0123. Uh, yes, it does, but what I, so, so that's also a possible candidate. But when it finally goes and tries to rank the fixes, it will prioritize this fix because it finds that from a bug report study, the off by one error was a pretty common pattern. So we, we also so, so we look at common patterns of bugs that programmers make. And so if there are multiple possible fixes, we try to prioritize it based on those common patterns. Okay, but anyway, so it, it actually finds these three candidates here as possible matches. Then what it would do is it would actually you, it, we use a Hampy string solver to find what should have been changed in this code so that this last part ma matches PRE012. And that could be an empty string, for example. So at the end of this whole procedure, what we would do is come back and say, this is an off by one error. This is actually the literal output on this code. It says modify, modify the upper bound of the for loop that contains uh, line 3, which is the one in line 2 here. And the upper bound, okay, here it doesn't tell you how to modify it, but you can figure that out by just looking at the trace. So this is uh, what we believe will be useful to a programmer who has to wade through a lot of DOM manipulating code. So it at least gives you suggestions on what to change so that your code can pass and not throw an exception. By no means am I saying this is the correct fix. So it could be, so you, as a programmer, you still need to look at it. So all it's telling is this is a workaround you have to decide whether this is the fix you intended. But I will say this, that in the, in the bug report study, many of the fixes we found were actually workarounds. They didn't really fix the problem. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, where was the exception thrown here? Oh, the, okay, so the exception was thrown here in, uh, in this one. Because what happens is, okay, sorry, I should have gone through that slower. So you see there's a PRE, right, it's trying to find 0, 1, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 3. The problem is there's no P element with the class PRE 0, 1, 2, 3. And the exception is thrown in this line, line 5, because you're trying to use it. Okay. Uh, of course, I'm, for space reasons, I've compressed this. This could span multiple screenfuls of code. Right. Any other questions about this? So, yeah. So, both the tools uh, come with a, uh, basically, both the tools work because there's an exception, an alert of Right. Yes. So, so here we are assuming that the, accept, the, the error results in an exception because we don't have a tool to actually find errors that don't result in exceptions. Yeah, so okay. you just give a warning at the right time saying that, okay, you are creating an alpha Even that I think would be very useful. It could be useful, I agree. You'd have to, you but know. Also, we expect something to come out of the down right? It's very rare that we don't I don't know if I agree with it. We have seen cases where, okay, I, this is a little bit of a uh, in, in Amazon.com, for example, they use this, they use whether something is null to determine whether you're logged in or not. So we found that if you actually change that value, you can pretend to Amazon that you're logged in and leave a comment when you're not supposed to. Okay, okay, I agree. I mean, I was just. <laughs> but it could. Mm -hmm. From a typing perspective, it could have a typing system that distinguishes nullable value and non nullable That's true. Yes. So, so I, I've chosen null because it's, it's an easy example to give, but the tool works with any other kinds of exceptions. It would also work if you had, if you as a programmer went and said, this DOM portion is bad, you know, tell me why, you know, try to find a fix. But the problem is that requires us to stare at the screen and say this is wrong and this is right, not, and it becomes subjective. So we wanted to have an objective way to evaluate it. So I'm going to skip to the uh, to the future directions and also say a little bit about some other work we are doing in this space. So one of the future directions we are trying to do is to actually build an IDE that lets programmers reason about DOM interactions. Because this is really the Achilles heel of, uh, it seems like from the study, that DOM interactions are very complex and programmers don't have a good model. So we are trying to provide support for this. We also are looking at automated code synthesis techniques so that you write annotations as to how you want to manipulate the DOM and then 
the the the, the synthesis tool will actually generate those uh, the, the 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 get element by IDs and so on. This is very early work. Okay, I don't have any results to show here, but we think this could be promising again because the search space is much more restricted. We are only looking at the DOM. Um, going forward, we actually want to support HTML5 also. So for those of you who may not know, HTML5 is considered this uh, panacea for web as well as mobile application development. But unfortunately, it has a lot of uh, features similar to DOM interaction as Canvas interactions, local storage, all of which have state. And it's going to be a nightmare uh, for programmers to reason about this correctly and to build robust code. So OK, that's going to keep us busy for a while, we think. Uh, so this is something we are actively exploring. Just want to spend two more minutes saying a little bit about some other work we're doing in this area. Uh, we've, uh, so the, the, the work I spoke about was on bug report study and tools. We've also been looking at generating test cases for JavaScript-based web applications. So my student built a mutation-based testing to mutate, to, to assess the quality of a test suite by generating mutants, and then to actually figure out through a dynamic analysis which portions of the code should be touched uh, or likely to be touched by equivalent mutants. So you can, you can prioritize your testing by not running these equivalent mutants. So uh, one interesting thing here is we also introduced JavaScript and DOM specific mutations, which could be used beyond the, the specific use we uh, put it for. Uh, we also have a, a, a tool on actually generating oracles and unit tests from web crawling. Like when you crawl a JavaScript heavy web application, you get a lot of traces. So we ask, can we convert those traces to unit tests for this piece of code and also generate oracles? And the high-level idea here is we extract invariants from the code, and then we try to convert those invariants to oracles. Uh, the final tool which we are so working in this space is just understanding DOM and uh, timeouts and things like that in JavaScript code. So the idea is we instrument a complex piece of code, and then we visualize the, the links between different events in the code, as well as the, how it interacts with the DOM, etc. So this is also. And, and we've done user studies which show that Clematis, with Clematis, our tool, we can find a bug five times faster than with Firebug. Now, that's not to suggest that Clematis is so good. Uh, I'll let you infer the, the corollary. Firebug is not very powerful. Okay, so it, it sort of works in our favor. But unfortunately, Firebug seems to be at least um, one, 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 one of the important tools in this community to find the source of the bug. So uh, we were able to do much better than that. Um, so to conclude my talk, I hope I've convinced you that reliability is a significant challenge in modern web applications. And we have characterized the reliability of modern web applications by looking at bug reports. And we find that many of them are DOM related, both in terms of impact as just in terms of numbers. So this is an area that has not been explored by the research community. A lot of work on JavaScript has been on things like evals and so on, which does not seem to be the main reason why these things are failing in the wild. So we, we really need tools to look at this interaction between DOM and JavaScript, because that's where the bugs are. And we've only scratched the tip of the iceberg here. We have built two tools to localize the DOM-related faults, as well as to automatically fix DOM-related faults. But for sure, there's a lot more that can be done. Finally, of course, my talk title was inspired by the cult classic Dr. Strange Love, where it's uh, how I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb. And in the end, he doesn't really stop worrying. So I haven't stopped worrying about the DOM either. OK, thank you. Happy to take more questions. Yes, please. I have a question. So you know, in the old days, before people started building you know, UIs and browsers, right? mm -hmm. we used to use you know, MFCs and right. uh, you know, various kinds of frameworks right. to, to design UIs. Mm -hmm. Then they started using it in XAML and so on. Mm -hmm. And um, and then code behind would be generated by when you click on something and then the field names and everything. Yep. They will all be type checked and mm -hmm. so on, right? I'm wondering these errors must have shown up then as well, right? I mean I think you know, at the time people used you know, Java and C sharp right. and, and and the language type system right. gave right. you some protection. Do you have right. a key for actually, you know, 
Well, so so okay. So maybe I don't understand uh, question, but uh, so I don't know uh, what the equivalent of the DOM would have been in a MFC uh, uh, application. Resources file, for instance, has strings and it has a name for a string. And the way you access it is you get resource and you pass it the name of the string, and there can be a typo, right? But there is an intermediate step where you can convert the resource file into actually a C sharp file, right? Mm -hmm. And then you call a function, and if you mistype the name of the function, which was the name of the string originally, you wouldn't get a compiler. So you are introducing strong typing with yeah. the so, 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 but in that specific example, right, the resources file, I don't think, changes during the course of the application's execution, oh, yeah. does it? Okay, so then, yeah, then it's equal to the it, removing it, right. editing okay. it. You know, right. Yeah, because DOM is a highly dynamic entity, and I think part. Not during course of execution. Yeah, yeah. changing the course, course of execution. But, I mean, so once you compile it, it once right. you compile it, it's. Yeah, so that's the difference, right? The difference is the DOM changes. Yeah. Right. So, you, so at any point, you need to have a correct mental model of the correct state of the DOM. So, so, so in the old world, right? Mm -hmm. You still have the heap, right? Like, for example, when I click ah, on okay. the Windows, right? Then right. my heap just reflects the state of a UI, right? So all right. that state was in the heap, and you could still get heap errors. Right. Right. I guess the right. difference is that the, the you had to plan the UI upfront. Yeah. You couldn't dynamically change the state the, the UI. Right. Uh, you could you could add you could make things visible, uh, no, disable things. Take a data so table for instance. That's mm -hmm. adding and removing elements. Right. You can add and remove elements, but you can't. But that's changing the state. For example, you can't dynamically say that oh here's I'll dynamically create a table. But with a mm -hmm. table, you have you can have UI right. right. yeah. 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 No, you you, no. you have to you have to provision for that element right. in the UI upfront right. in the app. You can't dynamically. Yeah. You, 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 you cannot control the contents of that table. Right, but but the but, is fine, but the content is anyway. Right. But no, even the structure can change, right? The structure of the content. Yeah. Right. Yeah. With, I mean, one common element in all these cases seems to be that. Though there is a static structure the programmer has, mm -hmm. you are embedding it into a very generic tree-like structure that the UI framework supports. Which because can evolve right, over time. Right. Which can evolve, evolve over, time, over time, but there is also the problem that though there is a static typing, you are mapping to an untyped tree-like structure. Which well, means you can't use static naming that can be checked by a static type. Exactly, checker. exactly. Right, right. Which is, yeah. Yeah. So in, in the conventional languages, you have to provision the, the, the structure of the UI right. upfront. Yeah. No, no, I, even with many mm -hmm. of the UI frameworks, you would use these tree-like structures to, as opposed to a programmer-defined application-specific class mm -hmm. structure. But, but, but I mean, how much change does that tree-like structure undergo during the course of the execution? No, no. The, 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 there is the dynamic nature, that is one thing. Okay. The other is switching to a generic tree as opposed to a type I see. Okay, structure. I see. I see what you're saying. Right. right. If it's a type structure, every name is a, it's, it's like, Instead of having a class with fields f, g, and h, you mm -hmm. started using objects and started asking for child 0, child 1, child right. 2, the possibilities of errors increase. Right, right. Actually, uh, one interesting thing we study, study we did, I didn't mention it. We looked at how the top 100 web applications, how, what their DOM structure looks like. And we found that many of them actually sort of use a hierarchical naming. Like they say ID and then ID underscore R for the children. ID underscore R underscore T. So it seems like this mapping exists in the mind of the programmer. It exists, or, but they embed it within the string. Yeah, they embed it in the string, exactly. And you don't get the type checking. So how, how, much, how much of this, you know, how much of this embedding is really needed? Why can't, you know, mm -hmm. is, is this freedom of completely <laughs> So you're saying go? Let's go back to the web Bono world where JavaScript code didn't change, or you didn't have to have JavaScript code, right? Other applications like Silverlight, for example, right? Silverlight, uh -huh. WPF. Okay. Of UI programming paradigms. Mm -hmm. You have all these kind of problems. Okay. Just right. around those things. Then right. we don't allow like this kind of ID manipulation. Right. Less okay. Less okay. Less okay. okay. So, so, so if you ask me for my opinion, I think that train has left the station, right? I don't think now we can haul it yeah. back in and say we're not going to allow this freedom. What we can do is to provide tools or or more structured ways of expressing those kinds of transformations. And that I agree with you. So you, you probably don't want to take away the capability, but maybe you channel it yeah, in some framework. Or, but I agree with him that like, if we had restricted the freedom, I think there would have been lesser problems. Right. I think there are a lot of things in the answer. <laughs> <laughs> right. Where is Silverlight? Silverlight is there. Oh, oh. There are lots of programs written in Silverlight, but not written.
Okay. That's mainly because of task that's not problem, right? Not because of the language itself. But it's a good okay. language, it has fewer problems. You, you, you know, you know the, the other, you know, if you look at it from a library perspective, there have been a lot of libraries that people have released and so on. And none of them really sort of attack this core problem, right? So we didn't actually see the, the use of a library mitigating or changing this in any way. If anything, as I said, the correlation went the other way because probably the code is very complex. So you're using all these libraries and you ended up having more of these kinds of bugs. So, so yeah, I mean, maybe, you know, if you, if you can, write a library and, and, and uh, ensure it's adoption, then this problem would be simpler. But the, the, the point I want to make is that most of the research community's effect, uh, efforts in this space have been around the features of the JavaScript language itself as opposed to the, to the interface. And whereas most of the problems seem to be on the interface. So we need to put more effort in at See, making the interface. Maybe some, may, some relationship actually is that when you try to, I mean, the JavaScript language interacting with the DOM, mm -hmm. right, is somewhat philosophically similar to an object-oriented program interacting with a database, which has its own schema, right? Those are two different okay. And people came up with, you know, object relational maps, and yeah. then there is, mm -hmm. there is link, and so on, which actually typed it, and mm -hmm. so on. And then there are possible solutions. I mean, what you have to do there is that you, you can't say the DOM is something that is new, whatever. You have to actually have schema. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> and you have to have, have right. So, so in fact, one of the things we did earlier was we tried to find invariants of the DOM tree. So we found that many web pages, about 90% of the DOM remains static. There's only a ten small portion that's highly dynamic. But the problem is that dynamic uh, proportion is actually very difficult to predict statically. Like we couldn't find a pattern to characterize the that ten percent that was changing. So yeah, so for the other ninety percent, yeah, you could do all this schema maybe you know statically even map it out but I don't know how to what capture this change sorry were there any exceptions you discovered in that 90%? you mean exceptions thrown yeah uh, we didn't go and map that back so that was actually another thing we were trying to find Dom invariance we didn't actually try to do it on the it would be top interesting. Of, yeah I mean it would be interesting if you just removed advertisements from all these websites right well oh, that we did that that is that is only about 50, so so yeah you're right advertisements are responsible fifty percent of the errors we found in the original sure. study so you still have That's possible ninety percent of the money so <laughs> right so so so, so, so look as a, as a client. well <laughs> I think, okay, fine. All right, I won't get into that debate. But even so, you have, uh, so, so we also, so I, uh, we also looked at applications that are uh, more like, uh, you know, office applications on the web, right? Not websites. So things like uh, writer and so on. And there, most of the error messages were things like undefined symbols uh, or null, null exceptions. So we didn't, so with the advertisement was mostly permission denied errors. So for some reason, these advertisements were trying to read data they should not. Okay, they were being disallowed with the same origin policy. Yeah, okay. Now, but even if you discount that, that's 50% of the errors on the production websites and 90% of the errors on the, on the other you know, office kind of applications. So it's still a large problem. And, and you know, I'm not claiming, standing here and claiming I have a solution, right? I'm sort of just pointing to the problem and I think there's a lot of interesting tools that have been applied in other contexts that can be brought to bear here. Okay. So no more questions, thank you and look forward to talking more to you.